Welcome everyone for tonight, uh, to join the tonight. We are another open affirming event tonight. Tonight we have a special guest speaker and she will share with us her wisdom experience. And I will have a short introduction of our guest speaker. The guest speaker tonight is the Reverend Grace Cox. She is an ordained elder in the Northern Illinois Conference of the United Methodist Church. She served as a pastor at the Church of the Three Crosses, a UCC and a UMC congregation located in the Old Town neighborhood of Chicago. Fred is a member of the Northern Illinois dedication to the General Conference and Jurisdictional Conference and has served in a number of organizing capacities to bring legislation for full LGBTQ plus inclusion. She also has served as organizer for Reconciling Ministries Network and has worked with churches as they enter into the reconciling process. And tonight we will have around one hour in total. We can discuss and share and learn from Reverend Cass. So let's give a Reverend Cass a warm welcome. Yeah. And the floor is yours. Yeah, it's nice to see everybody. So um, I, uh, first of all, just want to say thank you for connecting with me, connecting with Frank. Um, I have fond memories actually of living in Hyde Park when I went to seminary. I lived at 51st in Kenwood. Uh, and so I'd oftentimes walk by uh, your church and just see what a beautiful building it was. Um, I had heard wonderful things about the community and you all are such a presence in that neighborhood that um, I'm grateful for, for your presence there because it was important for me as a seminary student. Um, I would just love to start by just hearing who you all are a little bit, your names, um, and uh, what brings you to this conversation today. So and I think maybe we can do this by mutual invitation. Um, so I'll invite somebody and then when you're done speaking, if you'll invite the next person just to make sure that everybody gets chosen. Um, Pam, I would love to hear from you. So I just got through eating, so that's good. <laughs> but um, I'm Pam Thomas and um, I, I don't think I ever realized how, um, how I felt about, um, how deeply I felt about different things. I, I've, I just, I never thought that, you know, people were different, but then certain things started happening. And um, I, two of my best friends that um, have been my best friends for over 20 years, um, that they, they, you know, they're gay. And I never thought about what I need to do to, mm -hmm actually like, hey, this is my life. These are people that I love and I know about so many different things. And I just, I wanted to be more, just to, to be more vocal or to not be passive about anything. And we were in a council meeting and Wei Zhen brought it up about the committee and asked for volunteers. And I thought, well, heck, I could do that. So even though it hasn't been what I need to do, but um, it's, it's why I, I just, I feel this need that I need to be more vocal and not passive. I just never thought about what I could or couldn't do. So thank you. Thanks, Pam. Do you wanna invite somebody to go next? I will, and I'll invite Mina because I haven't really chatted with her much. And <laughs> oh, she's just there, so I'll invite her. <laughs> yeah. Maybe she didn't hear. Uh, Mina, you are muted. Yourself, Mina. <laughs> uh, yeah, I. Hi, I'm Mina. Hi, Mina. I'm. Yeah, can I say anything? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, share what your name is and uh, maybe why you came tonight. Yeah, I just. Uh, first, I was wondering who I who you are, and <laughs> yeah, and I'm always I'm always asking wanted to wanted to asking ask the every kind of boundary, who made it, 
<laughs> who, yeah. who, who did who who did choose that? And the it not not the boundary itself. In our every boundary has some kind of power dynamic. Mm-hmm. Every boundary has the hierarchy, right? It's it just not distinguish something. It there is a rich hierarchy. Mm. Yeah, some boundary has a point out some power, and it just indicate to who has power or not. So I'm not sure if I can, I could, or we could, we could blur that boundary or deconstruct and reconstruct anything, not the boundary, then what? What do we need? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. I loved hearing more about you. Uh, do you want to invite somebody to go next? <laughs> to to this? Me? Yeah. Hi, Judith. My name is <clears throat> my name is Judy Lampkins. A uh, longtime member and friend of Frank from way back. Mm-hmm. And when we began to look at this and the fact that we had paperwork going clear back to, I want to think it was 99, where this had started, and then it kind of got dropped as, as things we got into something else. I think we got a new pastor, maybe something, and, and it got shoved to the side. And uh, I'm glad to see that it's being picked up again. And I just wanted to see where we're going. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. Thanks, Judy. Who would you like to invite to speak next? Peter and Judy, would you like to join in? Okay. Okay. <laughs> so I'm Peter, Peter Cohn, uh, and uh, I'm married to Judy Sandstrom. That's how I came to the church. And I was uh, in the church uh, back in the 90s when uh, we went through the process and did the questionnaire and so on the first time. And then uh, Wei Jin uh, uh, invited me and Judy to be on the committee this time. Uh, So uh, I try not to uh, turn down invitations generally unless there's a good reason. (laughs) So uh, here I am and uh, helping out a little bit anyway, if I can. Yeah. And now I'd like to invite Judy. (laughs) (laughs) Judy. (laughs) Well. Actually, I got on this committee, I think, sort of by a mistake, because (laughs) as I understood it, that um, Bell Scott had talked to Judy, and since they're both Mm -hmm. um, working with membership, I assumed it was uh, Judy Lampkins that was the one wanted, because I had spoken to Bell Scott recently. And so that's how it happened. Well, you can never have too many Judy's on a committee. <laughs> Uh-oh. Oh. <laughs> Everybody I, needs Judy's on a committee. <laughs> my freshman year of college in the dormitory, there were six Judy's. Oh my goodness. My goodness. <laughs> oh, well, it's so nice to meet both of you. Who would you like to go next? Um, I'm sorry, I was late. So, oh, so okay, there's Ellen, an Ellen on there or Wei Jen. It says Ellen, except she's mm-hmm. muted. There, good. Yeah, I can go. <laughs> Hi, um, Ellen. Sorry for no video. <laughs> A couple mm-hmm. other things going on, but um, yeah, my name is Ellen. I um, have been in the church a couple of years now, and um, yeah, I think it's I'm, I'm on the ONA committee because I really support its um, initiative and think it's really important for churches to um, be as like explicitly welcoming as possible. Um, and yeah, so I'm excited about all this and <laughs> to learn more from you as well. Wonderful. And Jen, what brought you to this conversation? Me? Mm. It was a Monday night, nothing to do, so we should do something for fun. <laughs> <laughs> the second thing is that I belong to LGBT community. I'm from Taiwan originally, and none of the denomination in Taiwan, they are 
open affirming to LGBT people. So it's very sad thing. And mm -hmm. since I have this opportunity in, uh, in our church, so I think we should learn more about that. Because I know three different denominations have quite different story to impress LGBT people. So I think tonight is a very good uh, experience opportunity to learn from uh, other um, pastors and other churches about the experience. Mm. Great. Um, well, thank you all so much for being generous with your time tonight and uh, also your stories. I know that there are deeper stories um, even just behind those couple of sentences that you shared. Um, a little bit more about me. Um, I'm Britt Cox. I'm a United Methodist pastor uh, serving as the pastor at Church of the Three Crosses in the Old Town neighborhood of Chicago. Uh, we are a, a very similar church as you are, is that we are a, a, a joint church of both the United Methodist Church and the UCC. I understand you all have three under your belt. So um, God bless you, because those are three very different traditions. <laughs> Um, before coming to uh, Three Crosses, I served at First United Church of Oak Park, which is a UCC Presbyterian denomination so I, or church. So I am very familiar with all three of your traditions and uh, how beautiful and how different they, they really are uh, from one another. Um, I grew up uh, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area of Texas. I'm the oldest of three daughters, um, and I was called to ordained ministry when I was 12 years old. Uh, some people, when I say that, they say I still look like I'm about 12, but uh, <laughs> it's been some time. Uh, so yeah, when I was about 12 years old, I, um, I expressed a desire to go into ordained ministry, and my church was really fabulous of recognizing that call, of taking me under their wing, of learning you know, leadership um, positions and preaching at a young age. Uh, and I was so clear of who I was at that time, which many teenagers are so unclear about who they are at that time. And it, it was really because of a, a wonderful church that took me under their wing for that. Um, and then when I went to college, I uh, came out as a lesbian uh, just after I graduated. Um, and I remember feeling this sense of fear not about the God who had created me. I knew that God loved me and God created me as who I was, but I was very aware of how the United Methodist Church would see me now, right? So before they knew I was gay, they thought I was gifted and thought I had all these talents that they would invest in. And yet when I came out, I was pretty clear on, on what the denomination felt about LGBTQ plus people, uh, and especially about LGBTQ plus clergy. Um, since I had been involved in the church at a young age, I, I had been to general conferences before, I had been to annual conferences before, I had seen on, uh, you know, in person kind of the fight that tends to happen uh, at those events every every four years. Um, and so, you know, I went to my parents, I came out, they received me and, and reminded me how loved and valued I was and to continue pursuing my call. Um, and so what I did was I, I surrounded myself with really wonderful and supportive people who would help cultivate that call to ministry. Um, and part of that journey was con connecting with Reconciling Ministries Network, which is, um, you may or may not know, is the organization that is primarily working for full inclusion within the United Methodist denomination. Um, when I was in seminary, uh, I worked uh, as, an, as an organizer on the staff, um, and I had served in a variety of volunteer roles with them, too. Um, and I've walked with multiple churches across the connection, um, specifically in the Pacific Northwest, uh, in the Carolinas, and in Texas, uh, to become reconciling congregations and to organize uh, at general conference around LGBTQ inclusion. Uh, when I was uh, trying to go to seminary, I was looking for a seminary that was going to be able to speak um, not only kind of a justice minded. Uh, way about doing things, but also um, I wanted a tradition that could receive me if I was going to be brought up on charges for any reason. So um, I went to Chicago Theological Seminary, which is a, a wonderful UCC seminary. Yeah, way done. <laughs> um, and uh, so that's one reason why I'm in a UCC Methodist church is because I became so in love with uh, my UCC siblings that um, 
uh, I just couldn't get enough of them. So now I'm a pastor of a UCC United Methodist Church. So a little bit about who I am. Uh, Wei Jen, I'm unsure of, of where you'd like me to start and what might be best for this group to hear, especially you all heard from Frank, who has a, a, has a perspective of how Three Crosses has gone through that uh, journey. Um, but I'm open to, to begin wherever. So where do you think might be best? Um, well, it's hard to decide. We have <laughs> lots of different yeah. <laughs> uh, angles to enter. Uh, we can share um, from the easiest part. Okay. <laughs> share the easiest part? Yes. About becoming reconciling or? Yes. Okay. Um, I would say, you know, from the churches I've worked with um, who go through this process, um, the easiest part is, is um, kind of showing up um, and, and sharing one's stories um, and connecting in ways that um, builds great community and um, kind of a vision of where a church wants to go. Um, and also, you know, receiving new people because that excitement becomes contagious uh, in the neighborhood, in your, your local context, people will start hearing that you are, are moving towards this, uh, uh, you know, of moving towards become opening and open and affirming or reconciling, and you'll receive new people because they want to become a part of that. Um, and so I would say like, that's the easiest part is the excitement uh, and the energy that you'll receive from from especially new folks who are wanting to be a part of the process. Yeah, I can give some feedback. Please join the conversation, everyone. But since yeah. we announced our project, we do, we did have new visitors that to visit us because, oh, I heard, I visit your Facebook, you mentioned you are doing this. Or they noted we have a rainbow flag on one marquee. So they want to just, they just walk in and join our worship. But I think that's just a beginning, right? We mm -hmm. can draw new people in. It seems that not only that. Yeah, yeah. for me, I sense something. Mm, they did, some of them, they mentioned open and firming important to them. They joined us several times and they just, just disappear. Yeah. What do you think what happened? Mm. <laughs> what do you all think? <laughs> Well, this is a story with uh, then uh, LGBTQ visitors also often. Uh, we do have some younger people, younger than us, <laughs> who have uh, come to the church one way or the other and stuck with us. But uh, generally, we're a declining congregation, mm. lack of uh, fresh blood, mm -hmm. uh, fresh members, younger members. Uh, we uh, missed a certain some chance maybe to publicize more uh, when we had the concert. We missed uh, some deadlines to publicize the concert that was associated with this. But uh, so I mean I don't know. Uh, Hyde Park has a lot of opportunities for people mm -hmm. that we uh, compete with. You know, I, I wonder also, is it because, you know, when we started, this was in the midst of COVID. And um, I think I think that excitement is there because Weijin, I remember the first um, time that we actually had a meeting, there was this gentleman who said that he had um, heard about it and he, he wanted to hear more. Mm -hmm. But I think, and I'll say for me, and I know I feel horrible about saying this, but be, even though we are open now, the, the church is, I just take advantage of not going. Mm -hmm. And it's so easy to make that decision, which I'm not proud of, and I, I should feel it more shame than I do, and I'm saying it so boldly, but it's just so easy to like not physically go. And mm -hmm. just, I think that that could be, a small reason why also and I don't think it's um just not enthusiastic it's just that with so much other stuff going on I I, yeah. I want to think that's a part of it yeah are you all um streaming your services online as well as being in person okay yes uh, and uh we were closed for a while and only yeah. streaming and so a number like half the congregation got used to staying home yeah 
Um, my congregation is going through the, a similar thing. We are trying to figure out who is still with us, like who is still wanting to be a part of church community, whose kind of spirits may have changed uh, during this time. For some people, they're still very nervous about being a part of big gatherings. So if you are not alone in this by any means. Our church is also going through that as well. Um, what I will say from, from our perspective, what's been very interesting, especially during the time of COVID, is um, when we were all kind of forced into our homes, uh, we had actually more visitors online than we did in person. Mm -hmm. And a group of those visitors ended up being LGBTQ people from all over the country, and even a couple from different parts of the world. Now, for a couple of those people, they, be, they belonged to churches that were either in rural areas, um, they may have been closeted within their churches, and COVID brought on such an isolation from community, from, uh, you know, even for the LGBTQ community, that was um, really difficult of not being with friends, not being with chosen family, and so people really flocked online to kind of find community in those ways. Some of those visitors that we received, they were searching for churches that they knew um, when they showed up that would be a welcoming space online. And even though the online space isn't as risky, because we were on Facebook Live, we didn't do Zoom, um, you know, you could kind of sit back and kind of be a, a observer versus a participant, um, which provided them some ability to kind of just make sure that we were safe, right, and that we were, we were okay to join. Um, but a lot of those folks found us through the Reconciling Ministries website because they knew if I look for a church through the Reconciling Ministries website, I can assure that those churches have been through a process that knows what it means to be a welcoming and affirming church. They're not just going to throw it on their website because it's a flashy thing to say. They're not going to say they're welcoming um, because that's going to help more people get in the door, but they don't really mean it. Um, they knew that by going to the Reconciling Ministries website that they could find a church that they could attend online and feel safe and get a message of love and support. So I would say as you think about, um, you know, COVID is nowhere over yet. Um, and in many ways, we may be doing this kind of hybrid way of church even post-COVID for a while because we've all kind of gotten used to this, right? Um, or maybe some of us have gotten used to it. I'm still not used to it in many ways. but. Um, you know, people are going to start looking for churches where they can can kind of do both at this point. So I would say that's going to be an opportunity for you as well as that if you have an online presence, people will find you. So how did so I how would people know to go to that uh, to that website? I'm looking for a church that's open. Oh, let me yeah. try to reconcile. And how do they I mean, how does that type of resource get out there? Yeah, so I know for um, some of the folks who uh, are United Methodists, they might just Google uh, gay affirming or LGBTQ plus affirming United Methodist churches. And what's going to come up in that search is Reconciling Ministries Network may come up. They also may have heard of Reconciling Ministries Network. Um, you know, a couple of our folks are part of uh, our online folks are a part of um, recon or non reconciling churches, so very traditional churches in rural areas, but they're closeted in those churches, and so they know what RMN is, but they don't be they don't belong to a RMN church. Um, and so when the opportunity presented itself to be online and go to online church, they knew exactly where to go to say, okay, I can find a ch church that I can be my full self in. Um, I'm going to go to the RMN web website and find that. So, I have a follow up uh, questions. Yeah. Just, uh, for, uh, we understand how about what congregation people they stay at home. <laughs> mm -hmm. But how can we create that kind of feeling that, oh, you are welcome here, especially through the live streaming? <laughs> how can people feel, oh, it's a place that I can just stay or have some other day we can in person visit? Do you have any suggestions for us to doing that? Yeah, I would say, um, you know, when you all began this process or ended the, or put a pause button on the process in 1999, the church was a very different place than it is right now. Um, I would say churches um, 
It's not uncommon for churches to be LGBTQ plus friendly now. There are hundreds of them in Chicago who uh, march in the pride parade that have gay members, gay clergy. Um, in the 90s and early 2000s, that was not always the case. Um, and so I would say that you just by having a welcoming statement, that's, that's not enough anymore to be uh, kind of sought out. Um, having actions behind that welcoming statement are really helpful. So it may look like, you know, an opportunity for a Bible study about liberation theologies and queer liberation theology, right? It may look like um, partnering with the LGBTQ group on campus at University of Chicago. Um, I have another friend who their church is uh, instead of doing like, you know, the, um, like, oh, what do you call it? Like adopt a child secret Santa kind of thing for families and children in need. Uh, they partner with a group called Trans Santa, which is um, an organization that helps provide, um, uh, you know, gifts for Christmas for uh, transgender youth who are homeless or have been kicked out of their homes. Um, you know, things like that, that you can say, well, who are we as a congregation and what will it look like as us being an open and affirming church? That may not look much different than what you're doing now. Um, I'm, I'm not really sure what some of the things are that you're doing now, but publicizing that, making that a part of your announcements. Um, another thing to do is, uh, you know, what your pastor is preaching from the pulpit is important. Um, people still go to sermons to see what the theology of the church is. Um, you know, using maybe the month of Pride Month to highlight specific stories and different voices in the pulpit. Um, having guest speakers come, um, all of those types of things um, are really important, so. So do you think that there should be a target so you, you mentioned just being deliberate, doing different things. Like, should we target more youth, more teenagers? Should we target, um, I don't know, an ethnic group? Should we target different themes or just throw everything out there and see what sticks or just, you know, continuously having different things? Yeah. So I would say, um, have you all written your... Um, a statement of welcome and inclusion already. Okay, great. Um, that is so important um, because that's an incredibly good guiding document to say, okay, who, who is United Church of Hyde Park and um, who are we in our welcome, in our welcome and inclusion of LGBTQ plus people? That your your way of doing that is going to look very different than the way Church of the Three Crosses is going to look because you have different types of gifts and graces in that church. You have different, a different neighborhood that you're in. Um, so I would say, you know, starting with your statement of welcome and ask the question of what does that look like in, in our neighborhood? What does that look like in, the, in Hyde Park? Um, what, does that, what does that mean for those who are coming into the doors of our church? Um, what does that look like on a Sunday morning? Um, and I, I always like a good kind of ending question to that is what does our statement look like when it comes true? So I'm, I'm uncertain of what your, how your statement reads, but um, you know, our, our statement reads something like, you know, LGBTQ plus people are fully welcome and embraced in our church. And so then I would ask my congregation, what does that look like for that to be fully true? So. Those are some things I would suggest. And I would say too, you, you may wanna ask yourselves like what are the needs of LGBTQ plus people in Hyde Park? Um, Chicago is so interesting in that it's so neighborhood based, right? Like we have these very clear cultural uh, boundaries within certain neighborhoods that I would imagine the needs of LGBTQ plus people in Hyde Park is gonna look very different than the needs of people in Rogers Park, right? Um, there's different resources there, there's different populations. Um, asking that question may help guide you in where you can be most useful um, in your neighborhood for LGBTQ plus people.
Wow, that's very important now. Hey, we have that sort of thing to do. <laughs> and I would say those, if, especially if you start with the needs question, right? Like there are going to be hundreds of needs and you're going to feel really overwhelmed. Like we're a tiny little church. How are we going to address all these needs? I would then say pick one that's either most exciting or one that feels like a good connection of where that need and your gifts as a congregation can really make a difference. Just pick one and, and start there and see where it leads you, you know? Any other questions or comments? Well, I'll also share that I will say that, um, you know, from a, your um, open and affirming statement will be really key also in the direction that the United Methodist Church is going. I don't know if there's any questions about kind of what's the status with General Conference. Um, I'm happy to answer any of those questions. Um, uh, I will say currently we're, as a denomination, at, at a bit of a stalemate. We are awaiting the next general conference to happen, which is um, supposed to happen uh, in either August or September of 2022. We have delayed that because of COVID. Uh, and I can tell you that there's still some question if even August, September of 2022 is actually going to happen. So that may be delayed even further. Um, but wherever kind of the cards fall after this general conference, um, our denomination will look very different because we're anticipating uh, a church split. And, um, you know, local churches are going to need to make some decisions about um, who they align with, where they go, what resources go with them. And I, I tell folks who have a, include, a statement of inclusion, that will help guide you in figuring out who you are and what decision you make, right? Because then you won't be going, oh, well, are we welcoming? Are we open and affirming? No, you've already done that work and you've already had those conversations um, in order to say, it's a very clear decision uh, which direction we want to go, either staying with, you know, a progressive leaning congregation, you know, denomination, or if there's a, an offshoot group. Um, now, not to say that those conversations won't be easy. They'll be incredibly hard and painful, especially when talking about history and resources and how, you know, how churches get out of either keep their buildings and keep their pastors. However, your statement will be really helpful in guiding you through that. Um, and those conversations and building of trust will have really helped guide you through that as well. So, you know, I, I actually wanted to ask you about that because yeah. when you mentioned that, you know, you were United Methodist, you said it with so much just pride. Ah. And I immediately thought about, you know, especially when I was in college, which was a long time ago, I remember that, and I'm from South Carolina also. So, cool. Yeah, the, the United Methodist Church looks different there, you know, in different places. But I remember the United Methodist Church had this commercial that said, all are welcome. Now, I had no idea what that meant then. I just thought it was, that's good. It meant, it meant a good thing, which I think it actually had more to do with allowing, you know, um, like Blacks and as ministers in white congregations and vice versa. Now that I think about it, it had more to do with that. So I've been really just heard that I've been United Methodist all my life and that we're having this type of conversation. And I, I keep thinking what happened to that congregation or those commercials, our doors are always open to everyone. And just knowing what that's going to 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 me now. And I, I know when this started coming out, my sister, my father's a United Methodist, retired oh. United Methodist minister, but my sister and I are both like, okay, we're not being United Methodist anymore. That's it. And I'm like, oh. I go to a church now that they're just part. So yeah, I'm done, which I couldn't believe I said that, but I think that was just a quick reaction, but it's, it's, um, and I know how different ministers back home feel who are all much older and don't really say anything, but I think I like seeing your enthusiasm talking about the United Methodist Church, which I just haven't heard that, you know, yeah. got that sense in a while. Well, thank you. Yeah. Some days I have a smile on my face. Some days I'm crying my eyes out, right? Like it's, it's, it's all there, right? Um, 
yeah, the, the United Methodist Church, I have a deep love for because they're the ones who cultivated my call to ministry. Um, they're the first female pastor I ever saw. Um, like I knew that it was okay to be a pastor, uh, because I had female clergy in my, in my congregation. Um, and, uh, you know, they really kind of solidified, uh, who I am and like the things that I really have passion for. So, um, I really, I do love being a United Methodist. I do. <laughs> yeah. I, I would like to know more about, um, uh, R, 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 M. And that is not only talking about LGBT inclusion, right? That they have, uh, we noted that more different agendas under this umbrella. Can you share with us more about that? And once we become officially uh, RMN churches, how can we move forward from, oh, we have, right now we have LGBT inclusions in our statement. How can we move, move on? Yeah, I will say, um, so I haven't worked for RMN for quite some time. So I know that the organization has changed in some ways since I've been there, but I have great friends who are on staff uh, and, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful organization that's uh, really trying to, has, and has for a long time tried to do some really incredible work um, uh, in the denomination. Um, I would say, you know, that our, that RMN, from what I've experienced, you know, they are they are really focused on LGBTQ plus inclusion, but they also know that that's not the only justice issue in the church, and that when we talk about justice or injustice, that in many ways those are very intersectional, and so you know, just like our identities are not just one thing, like I'm not just a, a woman, I'm not just a lesbian, I'm not just a clergy person, but all of those things about me inform. Uh, more of who I am and inform all those pieces of me and the way that I experience the world, right? And so RMN has really, um, in the last couple of years, decided that it's so important for them to come to this justice work from an, an intersectional lens of saying people are not just one thing and also justice work is not just about one issue. Um, we may come from a specific experience or a specific perspective or a specific passion, but that those passions, um, experiences, and identities really come together uh, when, when doing justice work. And so, um, you know, RMN is focused now on incorporating especially uh, conversations about race and colonialism, specifically because um, the decisions that have been made within the United Methodist Church, especially around LGBTQ+, uh, exclusion, I will say, <laughs> um, really are rooted in colonialism and white supremacy. Um, our church is a global church, and so it's a little bit different than your UCC or your Presbyterian denominations in that we are connected across the globe and how we make decisions uh, and how we allocate resources is connected uh, uh, globally. Um, that can be for better or for worse, right? Um, I would say, and in the ways that uh, we have seen that work, uh, is um, oftentimes, you know, I'll hear folks right after a general conference say things like, um, well, if we just left the churches that are in Africa, we would finally have LGBTQ plus inclusion, right? But if we look back from history and we see how those churches were developed, they were developed from uh, white um, missionaries coming over uh, to African countries and uh, giving or not giving, forcing a type of Christianity that uh, was from a white uh, uh, per colonizer perspective, right? And so our church has history of harm uh, and to say, oh, we're just going to cut off our African churches or our churches in the other conferences around the world uh, who may be a little bit more conservative in their understanding of theology. Um, that is, that's still an injustice to do that to, to those, uh, to those siblings of faith. I'll also say that there are incredibly welcoming and affirming churches and communities all across the world, including in African countries, um, that are open to LGBTQ plus people. And so to simply say it's a United States versus other country issue um, is also coming from a perspective uh, that's rooted in white supremacy and colonialism. Um, so RMN has said, 
it's our work as the justice organization committed to LGBTQ inclusion to come from an international or an intersectional perspective and to listen and centralize marginalized voices and people of color within those uh, conversations and decisions. Um, that's relatively new uh, within uh, RMN, but it's something that I'm really excited that they're, they're working on, so. Yeah. I have lots of questions. Actually, we got at least that's a question to ask. But everyone, please jump in. <laughs> I have another question. Maybe some people were curious about this. That what's the difference that once a church become open affirming or to become a member of uh, RMN, and and it, does that bring any difference or bring any opportunity when people or when the church includes the LGBT people? Yeah, I would say um, you know. What I do like about becoming a reconciling or an open and affirming church is that it shows that the church has done its work, um, that the church is committed to the journey of what it means to be reconciling or open and affirming. Um, and so it's not just like, yeah, we're going to, again, like we're going to put something on the website, but we actually haven't talked about what that means, or we haven't heard from LGBTQ plus people about what it, what it feels like to be in a welcoming and affirming church or what LGBTQ plus people need um, specifically in a, in a United Methodist church or in a church in general, um, you know, it's not necessarily a stamp of approval, but it's kind of like a, you, you've gotten your certificate that you've gone through the process, right? And it, it brings some, some, it brings some fidelity to that process. Um, I would say too, that like, you know, RMN has incredible resources, um, in, as far as like, you know, helping churches with resources about what it means to be a reconciling church. I don't necessarily have those because I don't work for them anymore, but um, there's a, a jurisdictional organizer or jurisdictional director that will be assigned to you that, you know, as general conferences come up and issues in the United Methodist Church come up, that there'll be a resource for you. Um, they'll help guide you through, especially, you know, the stuff that's happening in the denomination now, there'll be a resource and a guide for that. Um, as well, it's, it's kind of cool to know the other reconciling churches that are in the area because you all have gone through a very similar process or have had similar losses and wins. Um, and there's kind of a camaraderie uh, between those churches as well, so. So are these in Hyde Park, uh, what you're referring to or Chicago in general or? Yeah, so Reconciling Ministries Network is actually a global organization. Uh, they are the um, organizing church or the organizing uh, organization for LGBT plus and church inclusion in the United Methodist Church. They're kind of the ones who have developed a process to become uh, what's called a reconciling congregation. Um, and so there are, are tons of churches, not only in Chicago, uh, not only in Hyde Park, but um, there's tons of churches and groups globally who belong to Reconciling Ministries Network. I guess I was most interested in, in Hyde Park or the surrounding areas. Yeah, I, I'm uncertain if there's any other, are there any other United Methodist churches in Hyde Park? Maybe Urban Village. Ah, oh, okay, yeah, so Urban Village is a reconciling congregation. Um, so it'd be interesting for you all to connect with them. But there are, um, I think, I don't want to give a number, but there's a fair amount of reconciling churches in Chicago because RMN, uh, their headquarters are in Chicago. So there were a lot of resources in, in getting churches here to become reconciling. So um, every year there's like a reconciling ministries network, like, lunch that happens where all the churches kind of get together. Um, there's a big like conference that happens here in Chicago every year with COVID that's been kind of challenging, but um, it's good to get to know people who are of, of like mind. So. We still have 10 minutes. That <laughs> well, only have 10 minutes left. Come on, questions. <laughs> well, and I'm I'm not very far away, so if, if there are any other questions or any ways that I can be a resource to you all um, uh, outside of this conversation, I'm happy to be as well. So, thank you. 
You know, I, I will ask just one last question. Yeah. You've given a lot of good information on um, Outward about with the communities getting people involved. Um, what do we need to do to make sure that our members are those folks that come through our doors or that are listening online? Um, just what would be, you know, just something just to put that out there, just to keep them engaged without it being like a norm. And so people don't listen anymore. They just, it's yeah. just regular. Hmm. It's a good question. Have you all like reached out to any of your LGBTQ members to, to hear what it's like about to be a member at your church and be an LGBTQ member? What that experience is like? We invite to our friends to share the experience, but they are not our church members. Okay, great. Yeah, I would I would see if um, if you all do have any folks who are well known in your church uh, to sit and talk with you about what that experience is like. Um, I think that that would be informative, um, maybe to what what is needed in your church because those those needs may be really specific. Uh, folks may feel like it's a non issue and it's no big deal, but some folks may feel like, yeah, I still have to kind of hide this part of myself, or I still kind of worry about. X, Y, or Z, um, you know, see if they'll be generous with you all with, with their experience and what it's like. I heard from one of the queer folks in our congregation that um, the pronoun is the issue for them. Uh, <laughs> so, so we, we try. we try to yeah. have a smaller speaker on our name tag. You can mention all your favorite pronouns. Mm -hmm. uh, since I it may, might take a little bit longer time for the whole church to get used to it. Mm. Yeah. You all are doing great work. So I, I tell folks too that I wish there was a magic wand to just make, you know, everything come to fruition. Um, but remember, this is a journey. And, uh, you know, the destination is you know, the kingdom of God, right? And we're all kind of headed in that direction. So, um, you know, in the days that it feels like, oh, we, we have so much work to do, just remember that like, um, that will be ongoing. That's, that's part of uh, committing to this journey is, is saying, I'm going to be on this journey for as long as it takes to, for the kingdom of God to come to fruition, <laughs> you know, so. Um, all right, the very last question. <laughs> Ellen, do you have any question you want to ask? Oh, Judy. Well, if, if this is coming up for, for a vote in, at the annual meeting, is that right? Yeah. Do we have any idea about the extent of any opposition within our own church? No. Or is there any? I don't know. Or are, are they staying know. home during worship and are no. satisfied with that? And even though they may not be open and affirming. Well, did we do the questionnaire or we're just relying on the old questionnaire from 1999? That's, that's a little outdated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> as far as the people who answered it who aren't there anymore, or as far as. That's right. Know, there's another one in 2006. <laughs> oh, okay. So yeah. I would I would suggest you all, um, you know, when I have walked churches through a church vote for being open and affirming or reconciling, those votes usually um, are known that it's going to be affirmative and that about how much the margin is to be affirmative because um, it's incredibly anxiety producing, um, not no. Um, even if you feel like you've known your congregation for forever, um, inevitably there'll be some surprises. You'll go, wait, what, 20% don't want to become open and affirming? And those questions stick with people, right? Like, who are those people and why not? Are we going to lose them? What's going on? Um, and so I would say, you know, if you can do that type of questionnaire or if your pastoral staff can have those types of conversations with some members um, ahead of time, just to kind of see where people are, do a straw poll. Um, and if it comes back that you're 
in a place that you don't think that you should vote, that's okay. That's where you just step back and say, we need to have more conversation and we need to do some more learning together. Um, the, the LGBTQ plus people will be paying attention to the numbers, right? They're gonna say, how many people voted in this in affirmatively and how many didn't vote in it affirmatively? And to be a LGBTQ plus person in the congregation to think like, oh, 20% of this congregation doesn't want me here. Um, even that is really hard to, to think about. Um, you, you will not get 100% and that's okay, but to be able to handle that vote with, with um, intention and kind of going into it knowing what the vote may be um, is really important, I would say. Well, I thought when we had a vote before, there was only one yeah. negative vote. Great. And he, yeah, and was that in 1999 or 2006? 16, I maybe. Oh, 2016. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that, that, you know, uh, may have been soon enough, but I would say if your congregation looks a lot different then, 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 then I would, I would do another straw poll or some type of questionnaire just to see where people are, so. Yeah, uh, I just check out the data. 94% that's um, welcome anyone to become the member. That's a great number. Yeah. So I would say if your number is close to that this time, it may, may even be higher. Um, that's something to celebrate, right? So you'll know as a committee or as a group, when you do go vote, you can say like, oh, we know that it's gonna be something to celebrate. So let's plan for that, right? At our annual meeting, instead of going, well, what is the number gonna be? Are we gonna be you know, celebrating or wondering? Um, so yeah. sounds like you all have a great journey ahead. Yeah, we stood on the shoulder of uh, people like Judy and Frank. They did a very <laughs> good job in 1999. <laughs> I was not a Christian yet, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and, Lucky and just, born. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> well, and just, th just think of so all of the I'm like the 12-year-old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just think of all of the welcoming uh, work you all have done uh, without actually being open and affirming and reconciling it. Like that doesn't mean you haven't welcomed wonderful people and made people feel at home and valued and loved. Um, this just means you're furthering that work that you have been doing for that long already. So wonderful, wonderful work. Yeah. Um, any last comments? <laughs> Then um, thank you, uh, Fred, tonight for the wonderful uh, conversation with us. That's a yeah. gift, Brisa. Another warm thing. Woo! Well, blessings, blessings on you all in the journey ahead. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions or needs from here. But you all are amazing. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night.